All right, so I only got about 15 minutes, so I'd like to give you an idea of the kinds of things that, that are going on in my lab right now. Uh, as you'll see, all of what you see uh, on this PowerPoint is actually available online, so you can click through and read a lot more in detail what's going on. Basically what we're doing is uh, we're doing open source chemical research. And if you've been paying attention to CNE News, there was an article in uh, July, and you can see here, this is, uh, this is me, and there's Khalid and James, and this is actually uh, methylene blue, which has nothing to do with our project, but the photographer wanted something colorful. <laughs> but this is actually something that I think is very exciting, uh, which involves sharing all of your experimental results and your thoughts with the open community as you, you get it. And I'll show you how we can do that. So everybody has a different motivation with respect to open source science. Mine is that I think we're heading towards a world where instead of it being humans collaborating with humans, it's going to be machines interacting with machines. And on the way to that, I think that we're going to have to get comfortable with humans interacting with machines. I don't think there were there at, the, at this point, especially in chemistry. Uh, I think there were on the way. And chemistry is lagging behind uh, bio, molecular biology. This, for example, is a robot scientist. This is a uh, Ross King's invention. And it actually will generate hypotheses, design experiments, execute the experiment, and then redesign an experiment based on the results. Now, this is what's happening in molecular biology. And there's no reason that a similar thing can't happen in chemistry. It's just that they're, they're, you know, it's more conservative, and there are different ways of doing things. But I'll show you that we can start to approach that. So I don't have a lot of time to go into all the details of this, but the bottom line is I think that this is going to happen by a bottom-up process as opposed to a top-down where somebody decides how it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen because right now we, we live in, a, in an era where you can generate automated agents that can participate with the world with zero or near zero cost. And the, all the services that I'll be showing you today are free and hosted for you. So anyone in the world can do this if they have the uh, desire. So the first part of this is, you know, if we want to interact with machines, how will they know what to do? I think that's one of the hardest problems to solve. And the answer is ask the humans. And so a year ago, I started this useful chem project by asking a simple question, uh, submitting these search terms, what is needed now, a pressing need, various terms in articles that appeared in 2005 to see what it is that humans were saying is important to do in chemistry. And a number of things came up. But one of the things that uh, really impressed me was this, there was a pressing need for identifying and developing new drug-based anti-malarial therapies. That's a theme that was recurrent, and that's actually something that I've hit across with people who are doing open source uh, science in general. The other thing that happened uh, later in the summer last year is uh, I found this site called Find a Drug. This is a, non a nonprofit that uh, looked at enzymes of various diseases and had tens of thousands of people do computations on, I think, 500 million theoretical molecules to see if they could fit. And so they used this kind of distributed processing approach. And I contacted them, and they sent me their library of 220 compounds that are predicted to be enoil reductase inhibitors uh, for malaria. And this is what they look like. They're diketopiperazines. And the interesting thing about this is the, the whole point of this project is to do everything out in the open. And so the very design of the synthesis was done in a blog. And you can go back and see how the, those ideas developed. Initially, I was going to do a solid support synthesis and realized there were limitations with that. And then I came across this very simple Yugi synthesis followed by cyclization that is pretty general and uh, because all the compounds were diketopiperazines. Okay, so I'm going to be introducing various components as they evolved over the course of the year. Um, one of the first things that we did is, is set up a molecules blog, which is basically just a normal blog on Blogger, free and hosted, where you actually can put uh, the smiles code of the molecule that you're interested in. So this could be a molecule that we want to make. It could be a molecule that we need to purchase. It could be an intermediate. Basically, any molecule that has anything to do with our research group gets put in there automatically, and it gets this UC number, useful chem number. And then what we did is we had an experiments blog where we linked from the blog to the molecules blog. So every time we used adrenaline, we linked to that entry for adrenaline in the, in the molecules blog. One of the uh, intermediates that we needed to make is Dopal. 
It's this uh, catechol aldehyde. And actually, you can't purchase it remarkably. Uh, you actually have to make it. And so, you know, we looked in the literature, and that also is fully detailed. If you go back, you can see how we developed that. And it turns out that there is a way from adrenaline uh, by heating it in acid that uh, you, can, you can actually make this. I don't have enough time to go into the full detail, but it's actually kind of, kind of interesting. Um, one of the things that happened as we started this project, because this is all done live and because blogs, especially something like Blogger, is indexed very quickly by Google, is that other people can find out what you're doing very, very quickly. And so we started to get these, these comments by other chemists. Matt Todd is a chemist at University of Sydney, and uh, he was making comments about the concentration that we were doing this reaction. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the reaction had not even been finished, and already we were getting comments on it. And that's really where I see the power of this kind of open source chemistry. Now, eventually, it turned out that you know doing things on a blog was kind of limited when you started to accumulate uh, you know a lot of information. And so I created this wiki, which is just a website that anyone can modify very quickly to organize what was happening in the various blogs that we were using. Okay, and so here I can deta detail you know the the history of what I just told you and have links to the actual blog entries. Now this is the really nice thing as far as I'm concerned is that you know almost everything we've done so far has been failures, which is actually typical for our research lab. But because we're recording absolutely everything that we're doing, uh, we can actually use those failures to tell a story. So if you go on the wiki, we eventually did successfully make Dopal, but there were a lot of problems. There was actually some experimental data that was incorrect in the literature, and we didn't know that until we figured it out finally. But you know that whole story is available for anyone to benefit from. Normally, that would never make it into a standard uh, journal article. Now, what we started to do is, you know, as we we're using the wiki, we realized that actually a wiki is a better way to manage raw experimental data compared to a blog, because you can do things like this. You can actually click on a page and get a history of who contributed what at what time. And you can actually revert to any of these versions. So if something bad happens, you can actually go back and nothing is lost. And you can actually see for each edit exactly what was done. OK, so in this example, um, I guess this is Khalid, who actually you know, ended up putting how many millimoles he had of you know, the, the material. So the, the thing is never quite done. It's always in a process of flux. But there's always information available to anyone who, who wants it. So the really nice thing about the wiki is that it has a third-party timestamp that the, that the blog doesn't. That means that you can actually refer to a specific version. So if you claim that you've done something first, you, there is a third-party timestamp and a link you can give to somebody and say, I did that on this day and exactly what it was. And that's something that I think is very, very powerful as more people get involved with this. You can do all kinds of things. If you go on our wiki any time, you can click on recent changes. You can look across all experiments, what everybody did, and you can follow up and see you know, an NMR was done or what, what, what happened. Uh, lots of other interesting things. Again, remember, I'm using only free and, and uh, open hosted systems here. There's a, a little thing, site meter, that you can put in on your wiki and, or, and, and all your blogs that will tell you how people are finding your site. And this is something that I check every day. It's very interesting to see how people are actually finding our experiments. Uh, for example, in this one, someone typed in Schmugel, which is, one, uh, is a chemical search engine. Um, somebody typed in chemistry of protease inhibitors. And then we are linked from other blogs, so we can track how people are actually finding us. And this is a very important component of understanding how your research is being disseminated. The other thing is on the molecules blog, uh, we used various representations for molecules. One of them is Inchi. And that's something that, that that's a new way of representing molecules that uh, has the, the advantage that it gets indexed on Google in a way that is unique for each molecule, and people can find it very quickly. So here, for example, is a search of the Inchi code that finds our useful chem molecules <laughs> blog. Now, Dave Strumfels and our group uh, has been doing a lot of automation work. And so because we have all of these feeds available at all times, we can actually have automation happen to them. For example, the molecules blog has, at the very minimum, a smiles code. Every day, there's a script that runs that actually takes that smile code, calculates the inchy, figures out the molecular weight, and then goes online to find potential suppliers and converts that into various feeds. So this is one of them. 
And so the advantage here is that you can fully systematize a way of doing research where someone actually finding the molecule may have no clue how to find the chemical supplier, but they just dump it in there. And so you can see how we can start to do automation. Uh, I'd like to talk more about automation, but don't have much time. Uh, there's something called CML RSS, which is very, very new, a way of representing chemical information uh, in a format that's blog-like, but it retains the chemical information. It's not just a picture. So this has been a very uh, interesting project. What we found by doing this is that we are we automatically connected with some other open science people out there, the Synaptic Leap. A lot of these people are involved in doing uh, diseases that don't have a lot of commercial interest, and malaria is one of them. Most people who are sick really can't afford the expensive therapies. Another really uh, exciting thing is, again, because we're making this fully open, we can start to collaborate with people who are not even in science. Here's a collaboration at the Lehigh Carbon Community College with Beth Ritter Guth students. She has English students and she has technical writing students that are actually going on our wikis and our blogs and are writing about how that work connects with what is, you know, what people would want to know about malaria that are, you know, that don't understand chemistry. So she's, her students are interviewing my students and trying to understand what we're doing in chemistry and they are also putting all their stuff up on wikis and blogs. So everything is being shared in real time with everyone. And so this is really the power. Again, remember, if we were to wait to have enough information to publish in a, in a regular journal, none of this would have ever been made public. So our next steps, basically, we want to continue to extend our uh, automation. There's um, a website called eMolecules that is that basically catalogs molecules. They have about 5 million molecules right now in their database, and we've just submitted our molecules so that automatically our molecules will end up in the public database. Nice thing about that is that if you do a substructure search, they will find our compounds. And uh, the other thing is we are moving our spectra to JCAM format so that, for example, if you put an NMR instead of having a picture, you can actually expand the range, expand the peaks, and perhaps even redo the integration. And uh, so ultimately, though, we want to make these anti malarial compounds and we want to have them tested. A number of students working on this project, uh, Khalid uh, and Alicia, both grad students, doing experimental work. Dave Stromfels is doing the uh, chem informatics component. And remember, chem informatics is very different from bioinformatics. Don't get them confused. Bioinformatics has been around for a while. It has its own standards that apply because the information is very structured. In organic chemistry, it's a little bit different, and you need another system. And uh, a couple of undergrads, James Lynn and uh, Brett, a while ago. And also, I'd like to thank all the bloggers that have actually contributed to our work, contributed code, contributed ideas. And uh, we definitely will continue that. So if that's of any interest, come talk to me.